Hey, Fedheads. Welcome back to another episode of Cigar Chat. Uh, we're live on Facebook, broadcast around the world on the Armed Forces Radio Network. Um, and of course, available the following week on uh, the old YouTubes and whatever your favorite podcast catcher is. Um, I'm your host, Trip, here with my co-host, Jason. Jason, how are you doing this evening? Doing good. <clears throat> Trying to stay warm over here. Yeah, it's a chilly one out here. Um, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what the temperature is. Let's see. I mean, I think it's... It's in the 40s, so it's not too bad. Google says 46. Yeah, um, that seems about right. So, I mean, that that's cold for us, us Northwesterners. <laughs> uh, like, I mean, I think that's probably about as cold as it gets in the spring. So it feels cold, even though for normal people, it's not that cold. Uh, <laughs> and we're here with our special guest of the evening, uh, owner of La Barba Cigars, Tony Bellotto. Tony, how you doing, brother? Good. What's happening, guys? Um, as, as many of our listeners know, if they've been listening, uh, in sequential order, I'm just getting back into the swing of things. Um, had a trip to the DR, um, and all that relaxation kind of throws my game off a little bit. I feel like I'm used to being like stressed out and having to keep up on doing these shows every week. I um, notice the older I get, the more those time zone changes hit me too. When I come back home. Oh man. I, I, <laughs> I didn't talk about this on the show last night. So uh, Monday night, we decided that uh, that we were going to go see Black Panther. And the only time that we could make work with babysitting and stuff was 1030. And I was like, oh, I can do that. No problem. I go see movies at 1030 all the time. Um, and I, for the first time in my life, fell asleep in a movie theater. <laughs> Um, and like, I was in that whole, like that mode where you're fighting to keep your eyes open and it's just not working. And man, I, I had a rough night that night. Um, but we're not here to talk about black Panther. We're here to talk about La Barba cigars. Um, so Tony, for the people who, for the uninitiated, tell us where La Barba came from. Um, and about your, uh, you kind of grew up in the cigar industry a little bit. Um, why don't you tell us about that? Yeah, absolutely. So my uh, my grandfather started in about 1972 um, with a little book and newsstand, and then my dad started working there in about 75 ish. So right around the first when the first trade shows started started happening, um, and they fell in love with cigars and started put they put uh, cigar stores in all their locations. So then I went to fast forward to me. I went to was in college and I already knew. A lot about cigars growing up and stickering uh, Fuente boxes for my allowance money. <laughs> um, well, child labor. Yep. And uh, so I was already in love with cigars. And then I had all my friends over every Sunday night uh, in college for like a little uh, Sunday family dinner thing. And um, that's when I kind of fell, re fell in love with wine. Um, so I would pick up wine, I would make Sunday gravy and uh, or sauce. And we would have wine and cigars and play poker and all that. So then I left college and started working at my dad's store and decided to go to school for wine. So I went to school, Cleveland Wine School, and became a um, WSET certified sommelier. Mm -hmm. And I added wine to the program, spirits, craft beer to my dad's store. Um, and then in 2012, um, I decided to have a go at blending cigars, taking the, the palate of a sommelier and adding it to tobacco because it's not something that's been done a lot. So I wanted to see what would come out of it. Um, so I started going to Miami and meeting with Robert Caldwell. Um, him and I became very good friends. He essentially, I was, I was making cigars with him in, in Miami and then he essentially uh, introduced me to the Ventura family which I fell in love with because they're a uh, family owned business are very small and mm -hmm. it gave it, um, it kind of gave us the opportunity to grow together. Um, which I liked, which I really liked. Um, instead of going into a giant factory, um, I could kind of have that craft touch to it. Like I was telling you yeah. earlier about the, uh, you know, we're experimenting with some fermentation now that, um, wasn't usually done or was done a little bit differently and we're, we have the ability to do cool stuff because we're small. Yeah. So that's kind of my story. That's where, that's where the, the whole thing came from. And then I, I didn't even really, um, I didn't start 
you know, I didn't start wanting, I didn't start this wanting a cigar brand. I just wanted to see what would happen. And then uh, I started sending cigars out to friends and they were telling me the cigar is good. The cigar is good. Um, sending them out to people in the cigar community. Um, and then it kind of, it kind of grew from there. So we had the cigar first and then the name came later, which was funny. But. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that's a rare thing in the cigar industry for, for a new company to not really have a name, but they have a cigar because usually they come up and they're like, this would be a great name for a cigar. Let's go make a cigar that fits with that. Um, and then start, you know, branding it that way. Yeah. I always say it's, it was kind of like a, it was kind of like a band, you know, we had the, we had all the parts, but we, we didn't know what to call it. So, um, the name came from, I just remembered as a kid, um, I remember two distinct uh, places where I had the, the male rite of passage or the guy rite of passage, and it was cigar stores and barber shops. Mm-hmm. And my, my dad's barber, uh, he would chew, he used to chew tobacco, and it wasn't like, a, it wasn't dip tobacco, it was like the long leaf, uh, like red man. And this yeah. guy would spit, he had a 40, he would have a 45 on his hip at the barber shop, open carry to 45. Um, <laughs> His last name and his last name ended in a vowel, so we are Italian. That gives you any idea of, of the barber. Mm-hmm. Um, and he used to be able to spit in this spittoon like thirty feet away while he was cutting hair. <laughs> and uh, and that's where I learned that's where I learned like about women, about how to swear, about you know all that other kind of stuff. So I remember those two distinct rite of passages, and I just remember sitting there watching my. He used to do the straight razor shave, and I remember sitting him sitting there watching him do that shave. And just that, you know, that nostalgia of your dad teaching you how to shave or you learning how to shave or, mm-hmm. you know, smoking the first cigar with your dad and that kind of thing is, is where the whole um, name came from. It was very reminiscent of that and all that other cool stuff. So that's where we're at with that, with the name. Nice. That's cool. I, I like the logo, too. It looks cool. It's like you, you kind of see it from, from a distance and it pops, but you need to take a closer look at it to like really see the detail going on. And thank you. Since you brought it up, I, I was going to wait a little while to bring it up, but uh, you recently last year, you did a kind of, I don't know what you would really call it a rebranding where you kind of redid all your bands um, kind of brought the, uh, the feel of the bands back together and those new bands pop even more. Um, Jason, I think you don't have the band, do you? Cause you said yours fell off. Uh oh, we lost audio for Jason. Oh, I'm back. I'm muted myself. That Rookie happens. mistake. <laughs> no, the, the the band's back in there. All right, um, but Tony, why don't you hold up yours so we can see that fancy new band? I almost grabbed one out of my humidor, but I figured you'd have it. See, I mean, like it's the same look, but it's got like it's bolder, um, and I think it I don't pops. Think I don't think I have any. I don't think I have any old ones put on me right now. Yeah, if, if you're not familiar with the old one, it was a smaller band, um, probably about, I don't know, 30% smaller, um, and it was just the white and the purple. It didn't have, like, the, the gold coloring and stuff, which really makes it kind of pop on the shelf. Well, when we first, you know, when we first started, uh, even if you look at the old red bands, when we first started, I had no idea how to make a cigar band. You know, there's, mm-hmm. not, like, there's not, like, a manual on how to, like... Like you don't pick up a book at the library and it tells you, oh, we'll go here and do this and go here for cellophane and go here for stickers and boxes. And so uh, I didn't know like the little intricacies. And, and in the initial one, um, the I really wanted the gold. It's like a gold powder. Yeah. And I wanted matte paper, but the design would not work on that because of the black lines. And it was really hard to get that translated from English to Spanish when I was making my bands that, you know, I want this real matte minimalistic look. Um, so initially the, 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 the blade was very shiny because of the, the, the detail in it. And when we went to update, we updated the boxes as well. And when we did the update, we really wanted to, uh, we really wanted to, uh, give it a real minimalistic look. You know, we invest all of our money in, in tobacco and, um, you know, the ornate bands and stuff like that are, um, they're expensive. They get expensive. Oh yeah. So we're we're trying to do it. We're trying to do it the best that we can with, um, the little money we have. 
I think yeah, it turns out the, well, and, and, and it has a minimalistic approach, and it, it has a very different look than a lot of other brands. And, you know, I don't have any, I don't have any, uh, that old school heritage, you know, and that's what we kind of try to do is bring a new kind of new flavor to the industry. So. Yeah, they're kind of modern. Um, and I've got the Siempre here, which we'll, we'll talk about the blends in just a moment. Come on, camera. This camera is making me crazy. There, there we go. go. Um, but you can see like in that the the gold well this is silver powder you've got kind of that it's not shiny it's kind of a i don't know it reminds me of the uh like model kit paint that you would get when you buy like a model car and you're painting it and it never turns out that shiny chrome that you want um but it looks great on a ba on a band thank you here's the red i have a red too sitting here so if you want to see it yeah there we go yeah, she, it's it's just a nice, like, updated version of your old band, but it's nice and understated. I like it. Um, and for those of you watching live, uh, feel free to ask questions for Tony. If you've got anything you want to know about Tony or La Barba Cigars, or maybe even wine, because, uh, as he mentioned, he is a sommelier. Um, let us know, and we'll ask those questions for you. Jason, do you have a, a question to start us off? Yeah, so what, um, what's kind of been... Uh your latest project and, and work going on. I, I feel like you, you were on cigar chat a while ago, but we haven't really caught up with you in, in a couple of years now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's a, quite a few things that are, that we're going to do this year. Um, I was down, I was working on, I found a new one and only, so we're going to, we're going to read, <laughs> we're going to do that guy again, but <laughs> the artwork will not be my face this time. Oh man. Yeah. <laughs> That's <laughs> those disappointing. <laughs> You can keep those, uh, the ones that you have. Um, and I'm working on a, a Connecticut as well. That'll come out. That'll come out this year too. So nice. Uh, and that the Connecticut will be in the La Barba the line. It won't be in the Siempre line. It'll be in the La Barba. So okay. We're messing around with some cool different blends with, for that. And uh, the Siempre was kind of a jump off point with me playing with Connecticut. It's very hard tobacco to mess with. Um, so. I think I told you, Trip, before that the Siempre I made, we made that for my my dad. Um, yeah. For, some, for somebody he could smoke all the time. Um, and it's, I think the, the four by forty two retails for like three ninety five. So it was mm. the whole idea wow. was we wanted to make something that you could smoke, long filler, premium tobacco, um, that you could smoke all the time. Siempre means always in Spanish, so it's kind of like <laughs> we were at. Uh, you said you were in the DR. We were just we were at Camp David, my father and I. And we were we had got done smoking. We were we were um, messing around with Corojo tobacco for the red. So we were down, and it was 100 degrees, 100 percent humidity at the mm. factory. No air conditioning, and we're smoking uh, pachuches of, of Corojo Lajero all day and drinking oh, coffee. Yeah. So he's, he he gets up there, and he's like, it's like 30 degrees cooler up there, you know. And uh, we were having a beer, and he's like, can you, can we just have something that I I don't even want to think about really cigars anymore i just want to smoke something it's like you know you have session beers mm -hmm. siempre is kind of like a session yeah. cigar you know it's good it's got a lot of flavor but you don't have to like really think about it that much it's something you could just smoke with your friends and talk so yeah and that, that's exactly what it is like it's um it's a thing that i talk about a lot on our on our pairing show there's there's cigars that have like a depth of flavor and a complexity that you can't that you have to pay attention to. If you don't pay attention to it, you're kind of doing it a disservice. This has those, uh, like low level flavors. I call them that even if you're in the middle of something and not paying attention to the cigar, you're still getting those flavors and it's still making it enjoyable. Um, and so actually now that we've talked about the Siempre, let's talk about the other two lines. Um, tell us about the, for those who haven't smoked hundreds of them already, tell us about the red and the purple. Uh, so the red, um, in, in, in the red and the purple, I wanted to, I, I really wanted to get two distinct flavor profiles. And I was talking about wine earlier. Um, when, when I describe wine or when a lot of people describe wine, you describe wine as either being masculine or feminine and mm -hmm. not, not one is, is really like, Oh, I'm smoking a, a feminine cigar. Or I'm smoking a masculine cigar or drinking a masculine wine or a feminine wine, but just the general fl flavor profile of of each of those wines you could call as masculine or feminine and by masculine i mean like leather pepper 
cocoa, uh, barnyard, uh, mineral, uh, those kind of like lumberjack flavors. And then, mm-hmm. and then by a feminine cigar, I mean, you know, floral, aromatic, vanilla, you know, kind of like, um, very chocolate. Very, yeah. Chocolate, very potpourri ish kind of flavor. So I wanted to take those two distinct profiles and, um, and explore with tobaccos on them. So with the red mm-hmm. is going to be the more of the, of the masculine flavor profile. So you're going to get leather, tobacco, obviously, um, white pepper, black pepper, cocoa, um, dark chocolate and flavor profile wise on the purple, you're going to get more of those floral, very aromatic, uh, very sweet, very complex, very medium bodied, um, in flavor. Uh, the purple is a Habano wrapper from Ecuador. Um, it has, uh, tobacco in it called Carbonell. The Carbonell tobacco is what gives it that, uh, sweet, um, very aromatic, um, mm-hmm. flavor profile. La Barba Red is, uh, Dominican Puro. That's another thing that I w- wanted to do, um, because you don't see a lot of it. It's um, hard to nail a Dominican Puro. Right. And you, you, uh, for some reason, it's hard to grow. It's really hard to grow wrapper tobacco in Dominican Republic, um, and it's very hard to grow Corojo tobacco in Dominican Republic. And there's only two people that grow the unhybridized um, Corojo tobacco, and we use one of them for ours. Um, so I have original Cuban C Corojo tobacco um, wrapper binder, and about half Corojo Lajero in the filler. Um, so that's a very we used, I used a lot of one tobacco and instead of giving it that one dimensional flavor, I tried to give it a lot of different dimensions. And by doing that, we played mm-hmm. around with the different fillers, um, and just different wrappers to, to kind of nail that, you know, three, three distinct points of flavor. You know, you want, um, your, your spice, you want your sweet and you want your body the way I look at it. Um, yeah. so I think that red nails it on that. Um, you, like I said, you get a lot of that white pepper, black pepper spice, um, it's very aggressive on the retro hail, but when, when the smoke is gone, you get that real nice, sweet taste that kind of wants you to, it wants you to come back for more. Um, so that's, that's red and purple. And then obviously Sampere we talked about, that's the Ecuador and Connecticut wrapper. Uh, there's a little bit of Corojo Lajero in that. And we did that just to give it that, that body, you know, those, uh, like those flavor profiles you were talking about, uh, those low, those little nuances where you get a little bit of pepper, it keeps you interested, but it mm-hmm. doesn't, it doesn't, uh, it keeps you interested, but doesn't take your full focus. And I think that yeah, that's, what's that's a great way to put it. <laughs> All right, Dennis, or sorry, uh, Jason, <laughs> I'm see, man, my head's not in it. Uh, that's okay. I feel a little out of it too today for whatever reason. It, um, that's what happens when you take a week <laughs> off, man. Yeah, it's like out of the groove. Too long. Um, so you you mentioned earlier that um working on blending um a Connecticut and like I I think we just from having these talks kind of know why Connecticut Connecticut's kind of a pain in the butt to blend with, but maybe share that with people and, and explain that process a little bit. Well, the hardest thing the hardest thing about the number one hardest thing about Connecticut is it's very very fragile. It's very very thin wrapper. So it, it breaks very easily. Um, that's, that's the number one obstacle, you know, is where to find it. The other thing about Connecticut that's difficult is the color. So it's very hard to achieve consistent color with Connecticut wrapper. Um, it's a little bit different, you know, when you're dealing with a little like tobaccos that are more brown because the, the, the color consistency can change a little bit. But when you have a, when you have a Connecticut wrap cigar that has any difference in color whatsoever, you notice it. Absolutely. Um, yeah. The other difficult thing about blending with Connecticut is it, it gets bitter sometimes and you have to try to, you have to deal with the bitterness, um, even in the slightest amount. And you deal with the bitterness by adding different sweet tobaccos or different spicy tobaccos. And you have to add enough so that it doesn't overpower the actual flavor of Connecticut. But at the same time, you have to add enough to get rid of that kind of uh, bitter. The, it's almost on the back of your tongue bitterness, like a yeah, black tea or you know that that kind of tannic taste that it gets. So it's a very it's a very thick. It's like you know it's like it's like wine. Pinot Noir is a very hard 
scrape to deal with to make, but one when you get it right, it's really really good. And that's I feel the same way about Connecticut um, as I do about that. You know, it's easier you can with with Cabernets or bigger full bodied um, wines as well as cigars. You you can um, mask some of the not so attractive flavors when you have a real full body cigar, but when you have a very light, very mild cigar, any little thing that's wrong with it, you'll be able to take out of it. So it's just a very difficult tobacco to, to play with. Yeah. And yeah, I think the, um, you, I, I, I was just kind of recently thinking that you don't see very many like small ring gauge Connecticut's and, and, and then that's probably why is it that you need room to put in that other tobacco? Yeah, you, you do. It's a, it's a very difficult, I haven't, I don't even know if I can think of a of a Connecticut Lancero that I've seen in a long time. There definitely aren't many. I can't think uh, of one off the top of my head. But I also, you know, I have a soft spot in my heart for Connecticut because um, my father uh, smoked a lot of Ashton. Um, and I also have a soft spot in my heart for Cameron tobacco, which is very expensive and very hard to get. Yeah. But I can, my dad used to smoke 858s like, I mean, he would smoke a ball when they were, they were 25 cents a piece when my dad was smoking and that was a retail. Wow. Wow. <laughs> so <laughs> he, I mean, he smoked, uh, he, he worked late, so he would get home and I'd be able to smell when he got home because I'd be in my bedroom getting ready for bed. And then he would walk in the house with the 858. So I can smell Cameroon because I was like what, four years old. I could smell Cameroon tobacco in any, if someone's smoking a Cameroon, I could smell it in any room. Cause it immediately, mm-hmm. like, you know how that smell memory thing happens It immediately oh, brings yeah. me back to that so those are the two that are really special we have a cameroon is so expensive i made a cigar for my dad uh for his 60th birthday and i used real cameroon and retail wide it would be like a 30 dollar retail cigar <laughs> wow yeah <laughs> so and that's a that's a tough market yeah. to get into yeah all right we're gonna take a quick break before we get back with more questions for tony Bellato. Uh, again, if you guys are watching live, uh, use this next 30 seconds to figure out your, your questions for Tony. We'll be right back. Brought to you by Gurkha Cigars. Gurkha Cigars, makers of the world's finest cigars. Try the 93-rated Heritage featuring Rosado, Ecuador, and Habana wrapper, Nicaraguan binder, and Dominican, Pennsylvania, and Nicaraguan fillers. Blended by Gurkha's blending team at American Caribbean Cigars, it's hand-rolled Nicaraguan available in 35-count boxes. Talk to your local B&M about the Heritage today, or talk to them about other fine Gurkha cigars. Whatever your taste preference is, Gurkha has a cigar that's right for you. All right, we're back. I had it. I... All right, we're back. Um, and sorry, Tony. Tony was about to get into a story there, but we only had thirty <laughs> seconds. Um, so I don't know if it's something you want to talk about on the air or not. You can if you want, but I don't want to pressure you into it. No, I was just talking about Matt's uh, Matt's gin, and I I had it. It's very very good, and I have a an open bottle. It's supposed to go to Robert, but I don't know if he's ever gonna. I don't know if he's ever gonna get it. I mean, he's, he's got to come to Ohio for it, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. So I, we're we're here, Cigar Chat with Tony Bellotto. Uh I'm Trip. This is my co-host, uh, Jason. Um, we've got a, an audience question here. Kevin Gorey wants us to ask you about the Vest and Chaps picture. The, the what? Vest oh. and Chaps. Yeah. So... <laughs> um, I love when questions like this come up. I love that I know immediately what he's talking about as soon as he says it. Um, it was Halloween, and I had a Halloween party at the at my store, and I was running late, and I didn't have a Halloween costume, so I stopped at like a thrift store, and the only thing that they had that I thought was, I don't know, appropriate to wear, were leather pants and a leather vest. So I, I put in a can. <laughs> And a cowboy hat. So that was my Halloween costume. I think I've seen pictures of that, actually. <laughs> yeah, those need to. Sounds familiar. That's the lovely thing about Facebook. You get to look yeah. at what you did 10 years ago. You know? mm-hmm. But yeah, that was the story behind that. I didn't have any any other Halloween costume. and That was um, that. So I wanted to ask, what's it like? Uh, I mean, it's kind of common now in the industry, but 
But what's it like for you being on both sides of the business, retail and brand? What do you mean? Sorry. Uh, uh, what's it? What's your like? What's your balance between the two? Like, like you're you're mostly store running the store, and then a little bit yeah, of involved I, in cigars, or is it more of like a fifty fifty split of your time? It's more like right now it's a ninety ten on on La Barba. Um, so I kind oh, of wow. I, I don't I don't I'm not on the schedule anymore at the stores. I have managers. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I traveled probably. 250 days last year so most of i would say 90 percent of my time is on is on the barber right now um you know the stores were my dad's so those you know he still works and those are kind of his thing okay so he still works there every day and uh, i really don't have an uh, involvement in that you know when i'm here i'm there because i'm home now so when i'm at home you know i'm mm -hmm. at the store yeah. um but I'm I'm on the other side of the counter now, which is kind of nice, you know. My yeah, I bet. It's lessened a lot, which is nice to actually go to a cigar store and smoke cigars instead of having to work, you know. Okay, Jerry Stash has a really good question. I feel like this is a question we should ask every week to every single brand owner that's on here. Um, in your personal opinion, what's the best humidity for your cigars? Where do they smoke best? 60%. 60 that's 60, low 62 percent okay that's my personal opinion you know i i know um i don't know i just think 68 you know you want cigars go out all the time at 68 i like i really like i really like low humidity because i like my cigars to smoke but you know again that that depends on where you're at um in the country you know if you're at a higher elevation it's different um, because there's less oxygen, the cigar smokes differently. But I just, me personally, I like my cigars a little, a little drier. Yeah, I, I hear that from a lot of brand owners. Uh, I can think of at least two that I've heard within the last couple months that said sixty, sixty-two, like, and that, that's where I kept my humidor for a long time. I'm moving up to like sixty-four now, just so I don't have as many cigars popping. Yeah, but. And you have to, uh, yeah. you know, you have, when you buy them at the stores, you know, you have to bring them down. I mean, oh yeah. Generally, generally speaking, because cigars are happy at like 65, 66 is where they're really happy. Um, so if you don't, if you don't bring them down slowly, they're going to start to pop and crack. It's the same as if you, you know, you have a dry humidor and you try to bring it back. Because, you know, in Ohio in the winter, like right now in my oh, house, yeah. it's like 42% humidity. So, I mean, it's it's super dry. Well, not right now because it's raining, but in, in when it's snowing out, it gets real dry. Oh yeah. Um, but in the summer, it's like ninety-seven percent humidity. So, you know, it, that can really take a toll on cigars. So if you're, I, I really think that personally, sixty-five percent is 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 where everybody should be. I'm a little low. I know some guys are a little high, but I think sixty-five is perfect personally. Yeah, I, I think so, too. Um, it, it kills me when I pick up, like, some cigars at a shop, and it's it's 73, and they're, you know, you can just feel that they're wet. Uh, we've got some other some other good questions. Bob Langmaid wants to know, this is, um, he says, maybe I missed it, and you kind of did, but we didn't totally go into it. He wants to know why you changed the La Barba bands. Oh, there was a number of reasons. Um, one was I thought that the bands were with the new boxes, they were very ornate. Um, so from a de design perspective, I wanted to keep, keep it minimalistic. Um, from another, another perspective, another design perspective, I liked, I really wanted the, the matte paper with the powdered, um, foil. Yeah. Um, that was something that I really thought was attractive on cigars. Um, another reason, believe it or not, and it's funny that it's it's a relevant thing, but when you take a picture of a cigar with a shiny band, oh yeah, show, absolutely, it, it, it's hard to take a picture on on social media with it. <laughs> so, it's a royal pain. <laughs> yeah. So I was I was like, well, there's all these there's all these blurry pictures of La Barbara Purples out there, and everybody's like, what cigar is that? It's, it's really so it's 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 easier to take a picture with these. Plus the bands are bigger, 
Um, and I just think it makes it look a little bit, you know, more iconic, um, a mm-hmm. little bit more deco, a little more iconic than than the small blade with the with the, with the decorations. Plus, uh, the stars on the old on the old band were um, were from Honduras, where the original one was made, and now we're in the Dominican Republic. So I got rid of the stars when we switched over to the Dominican Republic. Yeah, that makes not sense. Not when we switched, not when we switched over, but I, when I ran out of bands. So yeah. Uh, and Anthony Rosicki says every cigar he's ever smoked at Havana House has been in perfect condition. So you got that going for you. Thank my dad. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jason, I'll let you ask the next question. Okay. So um, coming into uh, 2018 here, what's what what do you have like a, a primary goal that you, that you're working on for the brand? Um, it's just you know it's. The, the primary goal is to get it to as many people as we can um, and maintain maintain the quality standards that we we've, we're known for with with the purple and the red you know I don't want to do too many things and, and have too many irons in the fire um, with different brands and I just want to make sure that no matter what we do we we're maintaining the quality of product that, we're, that I that for the standard that I set on red and purple um, so this year, you know, I just want to keep working on working on those cigars and making sure that that they're the best. Um, there's a couple projects, like like I said, the Connecticut and the one and only that that are kind of in the in the infant stages. Um, the two and only. Yeah, um, <laughs> but um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's getting it's getting people understanding the brand. It's getting. Um, it's getting the name out there. It's getting the brand recognition. It's getting it's getting La Barba to be a kind of a household name, or it's in it's in most people's uh, five cigar rotation. It's kind of my goal. Yeah, that's that's everybody's ultimate goal is to be in the five cigar rotation. Correct. Um, so once you do that, you're set. Rotation. And I, I was I've always think it helps as like a consumer and probably as a shop too. To, to be a brand that's okay here's here's three or four cigars versus someone who's like here's a dozen different cigars because then it's kind of hard to get your head around it right that's a it's a lot and, and even you know i catch myself a lot when i you know i did a lot of the multi-vendor events this year and mm-hmm. it, you have about 30 seconds of someone's attention you know because there's a lot yeah. going on there's a lot of there's a lot of things that all at once, you know, it's a cigar lover's dream. You know, you're, you're seeing every manufacturer in, in an hour. So you have about yeah. 15, 30 seconds with each person. <laughs> so it's, you know, I'll even catch myself getting, getting so far into the red and the purple with people that they're like, they're just staring at me with their mouth open. And, um, which is good. I, you know, that you, you get captured their attention, but if I have to do that with, with 12 or 13 cigars, you know, we're never going to get, we'll never get the, the exposure that, that people want, um, that people want for the cigars. When you're out of shops talking to people, do you find that what, what you would consider the more average consumer is interested in tobacco and the process? Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's, that's what I love about, about being on the road is being able to, being able to, ex- to show the, the consumer, what all goes into a, a cigar, you know, and that's, um, it's very important to me and it's very important that people get down and see the process and, and see what happens. And, and it's my, my favorite events are small events, um, like sit down events, sit down dinners where people can ask questions. Um, because I love to see that, um, kind of wonderment and wanderlust about what, what happens and how a cigar gets made. Um, but yeah, I've, I've been noticing it more and more that people are, I mean, people have a lot of information and they're very, um, they want to know as much as they can about what they're doing. And that's what I like about what's going on in the industry as far as cigars and spirits and, and beer and wine are people, mm-hmm. people are asking questions and people want to know what's going on. And, and I think that that's really cool. Um, I love yeah, that. I, th- I think that kind of thing, uh, it, it's like a culture change in the whole country where, like, if you're making a grilled cheese sandwich, people don't just want to eat your grilled cheese sandwich and leave. They want to know how you're making it, what makes it special. 
um, like people are more interested in processes than I think they used to be. Um, like beer comes to mind. Um, all the advertising used to be, this is the coldest beer and we made it because we know how. Um, and now a lot of the advertising for beer, for example, is, uh, like, this is what we do. And, you know, in their commercials, they'll show them boiling and stuff like that because people these days care more about the process than they do about, uh, the end product. And I think, I think that's very, I think that's very good for the industry as a whole, Absolutely. you know, for, especially for, you know, all the things that are going on in it is for people to understand that, you know, it takes 250 people to make one cigar. Uh, and you, yeah. I mean, you said you were down there, last, you know, and that, around the same time I was. That's a low estimate. Two, 250 is kind of a yeah, like that's, low, moderate estimate. It, it's intense, right? I mean, it's, and, and you know, to, to have a cigar that's $8, I mean, that's, it's pretty incredible for yeah. however many people it took to make it. And then at the end of the day to have a, a premium hand rolled quality cigar for eight dollars, ten dollars. Yeah. I mean, it's not, you know, we're, that's and that's I think the important thing and, and the something that we need to as an industry and as consumers, um, we need to focus on with the government and with different things like that is this is a completely different industry than you think it is. And you know, it's very important to me because of the, the camaraderie ship and the things that, yeah. um, that is, that is very important. The, the people that it supports is very important. And the fact that it is really, truly a craft artisan product, um, needs to be, needs to be addressed. And I think that if we keep talking and, and yelling at them and letting them know that um, this isn't what you think it is, then, then they'll get the, they'll get the picture. So, Yeah. I think so too. Um, that was a good answer. Uh, we, uh, we're going to take another quick break here for one of our sponsors. Um, and then we've got a bunch of questions for Tony lined up. So we'll be right back. This show is sponsored by Cigar Oasis. Don't spend all your time worrying about your cigar wrappers cracking, splitting, or falling apart from humidity fluctuation issues. Set it and forget it by choosing Cigar Oasis, a professional solution which provides equal distribution of humidity with precise electronic controls. Monitor your cigars through the internet using the smart humidor Wi-Fi attachment. Why don't you spend all your time enjoying your cigars and relaxing and let Cigar Oasis protect your cigars. Cigar Oasis has solutions for any humidor. Make sure you set it and forget it today. All right, we're back with Tony Bellotto from La Barba Cigars. Um, we've, so first, we've got a couple of, uh, I'll call them joke questions. They're not really joke questions, but... Uh, they're going to make you laugh. Okay. Uh, two different Kevins have one. Ke Kevin Loonhagen uh, wants to know if your sunglasses ever get caught in your chest hair. All the time, especially <laughs> now that I have these. Because I got these, like, for soles with a little... Oh, yeah. Uh, ...that fold up. And I put them here, and, they, and the, the thing bends, and then it pinches, it pinches the taco meat, and then it pulls out. But I'm used to it now. You know when you first put a watch on or something, you notice it pulls out your oh, yeah. like, wrist hairs, and then you just get used to it. Yeah, you just build up a bald spot. Yeah, so I feel like Kevin needs to be more of a man. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Kevin Lima wants to know if all of your shirts are custom-made without the top three buttons. Um, I feel like there's three or four guys in the cigar industry that we get asked that same question to. I was at an event and with Robert, and someone brought that <laughs> question up. And well, my first answer to that response is I'm Italian and I started it. So we can put all the other jokes aside. We as we as an Italian American culture, we started this. So yes, that's true. But we also decided that we were going to start. We want to start a um, try to start a charity. It was like where we donate our top three buttons to people that need buttons. Because I feel like there's many people in the world that would really truly appreciate these three buttons and we just take them for granted yeah every day. you guys take them for granted you're not even using them um anthony rasiki has a couple of questions uh i'll start off with his first one which is uh are there long plans long-term plans for lost and found uh or do you kind of like is it a play it by year kind of thing where you end up you know if you, if you come across some cigars that would be good for the project you just go for it yeah, the lost and found is is a you know that that project is the coolest thing about it is there could be a hundred tomorrow or there could be zero. You know we smoke different yeah. stuff every day and and that that project um, is is something that 
we, you know, we, we wing it. It's, but it's fun for us. It's supposed to be fun for everyone. You know, we think the cigars are great. Uh, some people love them. Some people don't. That's what's, that's the fun part is the discussion about them. So if we never find another one again, then another one will never come out. Um, but every day we get new stuff. So, um, and so I actually had a question about this, that this reminded me of that. I forgot that I was going to ask you, um, so I think it was last year you guys came out with another release of several of the lines. Um, is that just more that you found or is that like a regular production thing where you're having more of that same blend made? We never thought that uh, it would be as popular as it was. So when we yeah. initially did it, we didn't buy them all. So oh, okay. when um, <laughs> Rob called me, he's like, you know, we still have Bambi's in Dominican Republic. And I was like, well, let's just buy them. And he said, we, you know, we saw some pepper creams down there. Um, and as, as the, that was like the initial, the initial releases. And as, and as time went on, we, we learned how to, to buy them a little bit better. Um, mm -hmm. And we got a better deal by buying the rest. But when it first started, you know, it was never, it's kind of like La Barba, and it was never supposed to be like a thing. It was just cigars that, that Rob would always come back with and send to me and be like, dude, this cigar is awesome. And then I would smoke it, and I'd be like, well, how many is there? Can we just buy them for us? And he's like, well, there's like 150 cigars. So then we would just buy them, and um, we would have them for ourselves. I remember there was one, there was a Lancero that he had. There was like 100 of them. And that was the very, very first one. And I was like, well, you know, other people need to smoke this stuff. because it's, out it's outrageously good. Just, they're just good cigars. Yeah. Um, but we don't make any of them. We don't make any of them. Okay. Um, and then his second question is, do you foresee any Nicaraguan production for La Barba someday? Someday, maybe. It depends if Henderson opens a Nicaraguan factory. Not necessarily. <laughs> Not necessarily. Okay. If I, you know, if it, um, I'm thinking about it. I'm thinking about it a lot, put it that way. So, you know, we can always get Nicaraguan tobacco in Dominican Republic. There's a lot of, a lot of good manufacturers out there that mm -hmm. I would love to work with. So, you know, we'll, we'll see, we'll see, but this year, I don't know. All right. Jason, you're up next. All right, so uh, kind of just a random question, but when you're out traveling for cigar events and stuff, do you have a uh, like a kind of place you like to try to find to go out to eat in towns? Yeah, um, I like those kind of questions. So, number one, I like to go to what the city is famous for. That's like my first thing. So I would always get like fried chicken in Tennessee. Or, mm -hmm. you know, you name it. Um, specifically, I just like to go where the people that live there eat. You know, I don't want to, I never, I never try to eat at places that I could eat at home. I, and I like, uh, I like to go to diners a lot too. So, <laughs> and that's where this is from the satellite diner and lounge in Spokane, Washington. Oh, nice. So my lady friend found it, and we went there. And I love, I love greasy spoons. So. Man, there's something to be said about, like, just a greasy diner. <laughs> no one else can touch them. All right, Jason, you have another question while I uh, look through comments here and see if we've got another Okay. One? So we know you're um, involved in the uh, wine, you know, a bit. And then um, you, you, you have a, a brand of wine, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I meant to ask about that, too. Why don't you tell us about that, Tony? <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> I, I zoned out there. Sorry. Um, I was thinking about the wine. Uh, yeah, so we, um, my partners, I, I started working with these guys. They're, uh, they've become my best friends in the industry. Um, they have a wine company called Treasure Hunter Wines. And... Um, I approached Hunter and said, I want to see, I want to try to make a, uh, a sparkling wine that has some flavor and that isn't a hundred dollars a bottle. So we started to explore uh, a lot of different places and we ended up in Barcelona, Spain. Um, the wine's called Viva La Vida. 
uh, means live your life in Spanish. And it's 100% Pinot Noir made in traditional method. So it's riddled. Um, the carbonation is done in the bottle. Um, and this, it's not the way that they make it is they set the, they set the juice on the skins for eight hours and it gives it that, that pink color. Uh, but we also did it because I wanted to, I wanted to create a wine that, that, uh, went with cigars that was bubbly. And I also, you know, it has a sparkling wine has a very, uh, female oriented, uh, mm -hmm. crowd. And I wanted to kind of show everybody that it doesn't have to be, you know, you can drink rosé and, and not be girly. Um, so the, the, the wine is specifically designed to go with cigars. And, and the cool thing about it is it's got a lot of these like very bright fruit flavors, like strawberry, cherry, vanilla. Um, and there's a lot of acidity and there's a, a tiny amount of residual sugar. So when you taste it while you're smoking, it cleans your palate every time. So if you take... Mm -hmm. uh, you smoke and then retro you have those like lingering flavors you take a little sip of the of the cava so cava is uh is the spanish kind of word for champagne because they can't call it champagne if it's not from champagne so the spaniards started calling their their high-end sparkling stuff cava which is spanish for cave um oh, okay so and that's where they do all that's where they store the wine and that's where they they riddle it and uh, that's where they do the, the the secondary fermentation to get the bubbles and so on and so forth. But um, it washes it washes your palate clean, and it's a really cool experience. Even if you just grab a prosecco or a regular cava while you're smoking, it it totally wipes your palate clean, and you can really taste the cigar in every part of it. Uh, especially if you like to think about a cigar in terms of thirds. Mm -hmm. When you get to that second third and you wipe your palate clean, it gives you a whole different experience with the cigar than it would because your mouth isn't covered in tobacco flavor anymore. Uh, a lot of people probably haven't had like, I don't know, a cava or champagne or a Prosecco or something like that with a cigar. But if you've ever had a like club soda or sparkling water with a cigar, it's yeah. sort of the same effect. Correct. And that's, that's when I am not drinking wine while I'm smoking, I'm drinking uh, Perrier or, or club soda. Mm -hmm. Um, and it, it, you know, it has a very cleansing effect and you can really get the tobacco for what it is. Um, and I think that that's, so that's kind of the, the, uh, inspiration for the wine. Um, so we've been doing, we've been doing really well with it. it retails for about $10, 10 to $15. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to do what I'm trying to do is line up with Hunter, um, trying to do some pairing events this year at, at stores. Oh, um, that'd be awesome. Getting that, getting that wine to kind of travel with me with our sale. But it's, you know, it's very hard logistically to, uh, to coordinate with my salespeople, with my Viva La Vida salespeople and get them at the same place at the same time. So uh, we're working on it. We're working on it. Hopefully I can start to do that this year. I need to, uh, after the show, we'll talk about it because I need to find out where I can buy a bottle of that. And I know um, you may have come to Oregon already, but I, I don't know. We'll figure that out later. Um, I got you. Don't I got another question from Jerry Stash. Uh, he he learned a tiny bit about Somalias through a documentary. I'm guessing he means Som and maybe Som into the bottle because um, those were super, super interesting to me. Um, and he wants to know what level Somalia you are. Well, I went to uh, a different uh, school than the court of Master Somaliers. So our, our focus uh, is on the Master of Wine program. So a little bit different than the, the Court of Master Sommeliers. Our program is a little bit more uh, viticulture and viniculture oriented. So the making of wine and the growing of wine, where a sommelier is, is very service oriented. So it's two kind of different trains of thought on, on, uh, on wine and spirits. Ours is more... Okay. Ours is more... I did a lot of of history, why things are the way they are, uh, why the laws are the way they are, why you grow grapes where you grow them, uh, why certain places only grow certain grapes, um, why you do certain methods with certain different types of wine. So my, I'm officially a level three, WSET level three certified sommelier. So, and 
the cool thing about um, the cool thing and the detrimental part about the WSET is that you can only take a class taught by someone that is above you. So mm-hmm. the next the next class that I would take has to be taught by a master of wine, which there's only like 20. So and that's like so right now I I would say that I have my master's degree in wine. The next step would be getting a PhD and they call that the diploma program. And that would be, I have to write an original thesis, um, wow. those kind of things like getting a PhD and the teacher that I had, uh, she is currently working on getting her master of wine. So oh, okay. if, she, if she gets it, then she can teach me the, the fourth part of the program. And then I can then mm-hmm. subsequently move on to the master of wine program. But it's like, I think it's like 20 people a year get in and it takes four years and then like two people graduate. It's like the most yeah. ridiculous thing ever. Um, but yeah, so it's two different, it's two different kind of, uh, schools where, whereas the, the, the sommelier, uh, thing you, you kind of just study on your own, then go take a test. Yeah. Whereas WSET, I went to school. So I was there, I was in a classroom every day wow. learning about wine. So it's a little bit different. It's a little bit more intense than, than the small A thing, but you know, it's six and six and one half dozen. So, so you're, you're becoming a master of wine, not a master sommelier then, right? Correct. Okay. That's where I t- intend to get to one day if I can ever, you know, that's, and that's like, you know, there's only so far you can get with, with knowledge. You know, my last, yeah. last test was like, was super intense. You know, we had, we had a wine that we had to blind, we had to go through blind and then we had a, oh, man. uh, a master of wine that tasted the same wine. And then we, they judged our scores off of their scores and you have to go through and you have to name each part, uh, through flavor, aroma, profile, finish, uh, color, all these things. And there's all these different options and you have to write a paragraph about it. And then they compare that, that paragraph to another master of wine that did the same wines mm-hmm. paragraph. And then you get graded on that. But, I'm going to toot my own horn. I was, horn. I was in the top 2% of all the people that have ever taken my test. So Wow. That's yeah. that's pretty awesome. Um, yeah. I I don't know if I could do something like that. Like I get nervous when somebody hands me a cigar and is like, what do you think? What do you taste? Um, and like that, that rattles my cage a little bit. Um, we got a couple more audience questions. Um, I'm going to, we're going to do our last break here before we move on. Uh, this segment is brought to you by uh, Jason. Who are they brought to us by? This last segment is brought to us by Drew Estate Cigars. They good. Try them. <laughs> yeah, they good. They painted this hat. They, uh, you know, they make a lot of great cigars. Uh, a lot. Like they're one of those companies where you could be very, uh, you could be very um, intimidated by the just the sheer number of different blends that they have. Um, but if you haven't smoked their cigars, I would say start with like Underground Shade, Herrera Esteli, those kind of things. Um, again, they're good. They really have something for every palate. <laughs> yeah, they do. Um, so, Tony, we got another question from Anthony Rasiki here. Uh, you have wine. You have tequila? You have tequila? I didn't know you had tequila. Yeah, I bought a barrel of tequila. <laughs> oh, okay. So oh, it's yeah. just like a thing that's available at the bar in the shop. Yeah, so we uh, – Okay. For some for some strange reason, um, I really jumped on this tequila and cigar thing, and tequila goes really well with cigars, believe it or not. Especially anejo tequila like uh, Don Julio 1942, or you know any just anejo tequila. Yeah. And we started talking with this uh, craft company, and they age all of their tequila in in different bourbon barrels, which is a very rare thing. It's a very small company, and. Uh, we started serving at the store, and I started doing these things with cigars, like cigar and tequila pairings. And then overnight, we became the second best tequila account in the state of Ohio for them. So they came and they came and asked me if I wanted to do a single barrel. So they brought thirty different tequilas in. Each wow. one was a different. Each one was a different barrel, a different bourbon barrel. So, like they had Pappy, they had Woodford, they had. Eagle Rare, they had Bullet, they had Jefferson's, whatever. And the, the, the guy that makes it, the master distiller that makes it tequila, did not tell any of us what was what barrel because he didn't want us to be biased. Because mm-hmm. the tequila marries with different bourbon barrels differently. 
So yeah. it doesn't matter if it's like old granddad or Pappy Van Winkle. It's all about how the tequila marries with the barrel. So we, out of the 30 tequilas we tasted, we got down to two. And the distiller started kind of chuckling. And we're like, what are you laughing at? He's like, just keep going. You'll see. You'll see. So we got down to the final one. And we decided, and we're like, we want this. This is the one we want. So it ended up being uh, 13 months aged in one Jack Daniels barrel. And the other one that we got down to was 12 months aged in Jack Daniels barrels. And, and <laughs> those were the only two that were similar. So it was like, I mean, it was every bourbon you could think of, 30 different bourbons. And there was two Jack Daniels barrels. We got down to those two Jack Daniels barrels and then picked the one that was 13 months. It was a very cool experience. So we bought the, we bought the barrel and we had our party last week for it. Um, I drank way too much tequila. And that's it. That's, that's, that's what happens. Um, <laughs> but the, so the end of that question, because I wanted to know about the tequila once I got to that point. Um, he wants to know if you're ever doing a craft beer. It's funny you say that. So I, uh, I've been in talks with a very good friend of mine to do a canned rosé cider uh, that we're, I'm going to start working on here oh. shortly. Um, so kind of use the same uh, method that we did for Viva La Vida, but to put it in, in cans and, and um, turn it into a – or blend it with cider. So we're starting, we're starting that process. Hopefully, we're, we're working on it. Um, but I want to start there and, and see what happens. You know, there's a couple of good breweries around here that I would like to work with, um, but we'll see. I'm, I'm, I want to do – I'm way more focused on wine right now. I want to do, um, do a red wine. Oh yeah, uh, I, I would like to. I'm going to start. There's a there's a company that Hunter knows that uh, in Oregon that makes some really good Pinot Noir that I'm going to go up and see, um, and I will let you know both of you if you want to join me shortly. Awesome, um, cool. I'll be there. Yeah, so I want to Pinot Noir is my favorite, so I'm going to start with start with that and see what happens and, and kind of go from there. But I love all all of all of the things that are uh, on the vice aspect <laughs> yeah <laughs> alcohol coffee yeah. uh and then i've got another real good question from steve callow he wants to know how badass the rap horn is it, you, you want to hear it? i heard it i heard it i still have it I here we go <laughs> <laughs> so that's, uh, that's tony's signature for those who haven't spent much time with him yeah I got it right there. I'm gonna see how many times I've done it now. I had to. <laughs> I had to read counter. I had to re-download it. But so far on the re-download, I'm at I'm at 934 times. Ham horn. Oh wow. There we go. <laughs> um, with a funny story because I've I've always had this like irrational desire to be a DJ, <laughs> and uh, so for Christmas this year, my girlfriend got me like this awesome Pioneer. Uh, turntable set and it has like the different sample keys and you plug in the computer and, and then I go just down rap horns every key oh yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> so as soon as I got it like Christmas day I'm in the basement I'm just pressing the rap horn like it'd be like a Miles Davis song yeah that's awesome all right uh, I'll let you take the, the uh, I guess the final question at least for our AFRN segment okay so as we're Ending the AFR in here, where, where can people find you on social media, the internet, to keep in touch? Um, so on Instagram, you can find me at Bellotto, two L's, two T's, at, um, and at La Barba Cigars. I control that as well. Uh, and then on Facebook, it's Tony Bellotto, uh, B-E-L-L-A-T-T-O. Um, so yeah, hit me up on there. Uh, if you guys have any questions, don't ever hesitate. Um, it's one of my favorite things to do with this show, um, and answer questions that you guys have. So, uh, please never hesitate. I'm always around somewhere. <laughs> always somewhere. All right. Well, thank you very much for joining us, Tony. We really appreciate it. Um, uh, and of course, thank you to all of our listeners, all of our viewers, um, particularly our armed forces radio network listeners. We appreciate you guys out there doing things. We're just not built to do. Um, protecting our freedoms and we hope everybody has a great and safe weekend um i forgot to mention i meant to mention it after you talked about the kava um, but we will have tony on next week for sharing our pairings 
uh, in lieu of a new Cigar Chat episode. Um, but we're going to be pairing some wines with some La Barba Purples, and I'm I'm looking forward to that. I think that should be fun. It's going to be a fun night. It's going to be a fun night. All right. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Thanks, everybody, for listening. We appreciate it. Uh, we'll see you guys next time.